But yeah, I'll go ahead and let you know some more about Karen and hand it over to her. So Karen T. Moore is the author of multiple Latin books, including La Bella de Historia, the Latin Alive series, and the Latin for Teachers course, all published by Classical Academic Press, and Honkus Ele Wakanis, published by Logos Press. Karen has served as the Classics Chair at Grace Academy in Georgetown, Texas, since 2002, where she built the th 3rd through 12th grade classical language program. She is also an adjunct professor of classics at Houston Christian University and a board member for the ACCS Institute of Class Classical Languages. Karen holds a BA in classics from the University of Texas at Austin and an MSc in classical art and archaeology from the University of Edinburgh, Scotland, where she spent time researching Latin manuscripts. Karen and her husband, Brian, are the proud parents of three Grace Academy alumni. So that is Karen, and I'll go ahead and hand it off to you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank all of you for coming here and taking time on a Friday afternoon evening, depending upon where you are in the U.S. or the world, uh, for taking time to come here and, and share with us. I will just start out by saying that this webinar is less of a lecture and more for me of a grown-up show and tell. I have become really intrigued with Latin manuscripts over the ages. I first fell in love with Latin because it gave me access to stories, to history. When I realized that I could read the words that Julius Caesar or Cicero or Virgil actually wrote instead of someone else's interpretation, that really excited me. And then as I began to find and learn about manuscripts through a friend of mine, Nick Martin, I, I began exploring the manuscripts at UT Austin's Harry Ransom Center, which I'll share with you in a bit, and just absolutely fell in love with their wonder and their beauty. And so continued to study those in Edinburgh, Scotland. And I find that bringing these in, these, these pages that not only tell the story of history, but are themselves pieces of history, beautiful pieces of history, never fails to fascinate and engage students. No matter what they might think of, of Latin, when we bring them in and they see these pages that are from probably the, even the 800 AD, we'll, we'll look at one, it, it really fascinates them and it draws them in. And I think they develop an even deeper appreciation for the beauty of the language and the value of the language. So as I crafted this webinar, I intentionally put pieces in here, include pieces in here that I think will serve you well, no matter what age or stage you teach, whether you're a Latin teacher or a history teacher or a literature teacher, or even a Bible teacher, I have something for you this afternoon. So let's go ahead and dive in and get started. So the first thing I want to do is talk to you a little bit about the language of manuscripts, the study of manuscripts itself. The first um, piece in studying manuscripts is called codicology. Codicology is the study of how books are physically put together. So think about the material that's used on them, how they are bound, how they are written. Paleography is another facet of manuscript study, and that involves the study of ancient writing systems and also the deciphering and dating of the historical manuscript. Hold on, I'm trying to move things out of my way so I can see. There we go. And then, Textual criticism is the third part of manuscript study. Textual criticism discusses how we proceed from a set of manuscripts to what we call an original text. Now, what I mean by that is that you don't have just one manuscript. The first edition of Virgil's Aeneid is, is gone. We, we, don't, we don't have that. But what we have are a number of different manuscripts in which faithful monks have written, copied over and over again, the words of Virgil's Aeneid. So if you want to take all of those together, and there are many, and then you compare their commonalities, their differences, and you try to discern their relationships and discern what is the true text, what is the original text. And that is what the editors, the book editors have used to create the book that you use in your classroom that has the nice modern print with the nice modern English punctuation and all the footnotes and all the things. So that is taking the manuscripts and carrying them into a book you can use in your classroom. Now let's talk about how manuscripts are made for just a moment. What goes in, what is involved with that? Parchment is a term you'll hear a lot. Parchment is always referring to animal skin and usually to sheep or goats. 
Vellum is another term that you will hear, also animal skin, but refers to a calf. Paper actually doesn't come into play until really the 13th century, and it comes to us from China. So if you see a paper manuscript, you know it's later. So then I always like to ask a trivia question. If manuscripts are made from parchment, how many sheep does it take to make a book? Any guesses in our chat? The answer is about 50 sheep make a typical average size book. But when you have something like the Bible, which is significantly longer and thicker, it takes about 500 sheep to make that kind of book. So you can imagine how, um, how valuable those are when you need that many little lambs to uh, tell us about the good shepherd. All right, moving along. Let's talk about details that go into a manuscript, things that I'm going to be referencing today in our, in our session. First of all is the term folio. A folio is one leaf of a manuscript, and that would be comparable to two pages, the front and the back side, um, two, uh, the front and the back side. So page one, page two, if they were back to back, that would be two pages, but one folio for us in terms of, of terminology. The recto is the front side. So whereas on a page in your modern book, you would have a number one on the front and a number two on the back, it's all folio one in manuscripts. Folio recto, one recto is the front side, and that's the side of the animal skin that's on the inside. It's next to their flesh and their meat, it's smoother. And then verso is the back side, the hairy side of the animal. And so one folio would be one recto on the front and one verso on the back. Prickings. Now prickings you see up here on the screen over here by the blue number two. Can you see these dots? These are prickings and they're actually puncture marks that the scribes would use to give themselves a nice measurement of intervals so that they can then make lines. The next term is a ruling. They would have either used uh, lines of, of thread carried across in a frame, or they would use some type of a ruler type instrument, and they would level it across the prickings. You can see here how um, the pricking right here is connected to this line. They would use that to make nice level lines that they could then, you see over here on the left, write words on and keep them nice and straight. The monks did not have lined paper that was not already on the inside of an animal's skin. They had to make that. The next thing I want to talk about for down here is the rubric. And the rubric comes from the word ruber in Latin, which means red. The rubric is the text heading, and it is usually red, thus the term rubric. And it's going to tell you about what you are going to read, what you can expect in that next section. Now, interestingly enough, when you come to liturgical texts used in the church for church services, the rubric was often giving the lay person instructions on what they were to say, do in the service. And therefore it served as a guide of how to act in a service. And that's why it comes down to us teachers that the rubric is the guide or the instructions for an assignment. Very fascinating, right? All from the manuscript tradition. Number five here is the illuminated initial, a decorated first letter. And that is usually going to be at the beginning of a section, just a beautiful bit of loveliness and also an indicator to the reader that you're starting a new section. Now, not on this screen, but what we will talk about later are two more items. First of all is in the incipit. Those of you who know Latin recognize that the word incipit means it begins, and that is the beginning of a text. Sometimes you'll also see an explicate, which is the end, which is letting the reader know that this text has ended. And then a colophon, which is the publisher's imprint. Again, these are things we will look at a little bit later. Now, as we tr transition from talking about manuscripts to actually reading them in your class, I want to start with the Gutenberg Bible. And I chose this one because I think it's applicable to really everyone um, who, who would study scripture at home or in school, which is a great many of us in this audience, I know. So 
Each one of us, if we are homeschooling or in a brick and mortar school where scripture is taught, we're reading scripture. And this really provides a nice way to integrate your Latin studies with your scriptural studies and also give students a nice, easy introduction into reading a manuscript because it will be familiar text. In fact, you'll hear me say this repeatedly, always show students a nice modern printed copy of the Latin you want to look at before you show them the manuscript. Because as you can see here, the font is a little bit different something we're not quite used to seeing. Now, if you will bear with me, I'm going to attempt to change my screen so I can actually show you how to access this beautiful copy of the Gutenberg Bible on your own computers through the internet. And Megan, if you'll watch your chat box, is going to help me out by inserting the links that you'll want to see in the chat box so that you can see the title, see the link, and maybe copy and paste it for your use later. Okay, so this first place is the Harry Ransom Center. Now, the Harry Ransom Center, I am very proud to say as a UT alumni, is right here in Austin. And it has one of only 20 surviving copies of the Gutenberg Bible. That is 20 whole entire copies, not fragments, but the entire work. And it's right here. And if you are in the Central Texas area, I encourage you to come see it. The museum is free. You can just walk in and it behold, it's right there. Eke, Eke Biblios. Now, if I scroll down here on this website, let's see here, here is my lovely manuscript. And I'm gonna go ahead and first, as I come to this, I wanna go to my settings and I want to make sure that your Zoom controls are available. And then I like to go ahead and go to my whole screen text. Let's see if this will work. Here we go, full screen, yes, lovely. And over here on the left, and I'm giving this to you teachers as something good to see, you will see this eye, and this eye is your information bar. And it shows you a lot of great information about this. We're looking at volume one, folio five recto, that's the folio that we are on looking at the text Genesis, and over here you can get see it gives you all the historical information. This was printed by Johann Gutenberg. Um, they're estimating down here, I think, yes, here it is, between 1454 and 1456, language Latin, and it gives you all sorts of lovely information that you can read about. Here, if I tap on these lines, it gives you a nice index where you can jump back and forth to different pages. Notice I'm choosing this page in particular. I had it preset for us because this is what I want to look at. Again, this is something that really even your grammar school kids could look at a little bit. A lot of them have begun learning Latin. Some words might be familiar. And a lot of you in grammar school memorize the days of creation. So I wanted to start here. We also see this word right here, incipit. And that's what I just mentioned. So you have incipit liber. Now, some of you, even if you know Latin, may be struggling to say, I don't know what this letter quite is. So for just a moment, we're going to pause. I'm going to move my toolbar. And I want to share with you another tool. Megan, this is the medieval writing tool. So if you would put that one in the chat screen. This medieval writing website is phenomenal. On the main screen, it gives you a whole list of texts. And I went ahead and chose Gothic because that's the text we're looking at in the Gutenberg Bible. Up, up here, you can see this is the medieval writing. This is Gothic. Um, textualis is what it's going to be. And I chose one that's particular to the 15th century would have been used here. So it gives you some familiarity. And down here, it gives you a lovely sampling of the writing, but here's my favorite part. If you hover over these letters, you can see how they appear in the Gothic textualis. So that is an E and ladies and gentlemen, it looks a lot like a C, just a bare wisp of a connector right there. Here is an F. Notice how it hooks down and that bar does not come quite all the way through. If I come down here, look at my S, crazy. Looks almost like an F, but it doesn't have that R. But then you have another kind of S that looks like this, almost like a B of some kind, but it's a, a curvy S. So this will help you. Here's your T, 
Here's your C. This will help you orient your eyes to what font you're looking at. So now I'm gonna go back to Gutenberg, back to full screen, and let's play with this text a little bit. So here we see Inkipit Liber, and this word right here, it took me a little while to suss this one out, but this is actually a B followed by an E, I'm sorry, followed by an R, an R and an E there. You can barely see the little connector. So B, R, E, this is an S, I, and then you have a T, H. And this isn't Latin. I actually doing some research found out that it's Hebrew and this word breseth is the Hebrew name for the book of Genesis. And so the author, the scribe, the printer here is telling us the book Breseth begins. And then we have this quae nos genesis, dicimus. This rubric is all coming together. Here's another interesting thing about manuscripts that can be a fun challenge. They're very concerned with space. Remember this book took 500 sheep at least to make probably more if you see the size of these Gutenberg Bibles. And so space is a commodity. So they're going to take up every ounce of space they can. And so this rubric comes here and it comes down to the next line. I know this word dicimus is part of this first line because it's all in red. So we have this word again, quai, uh, which we call dicimus, nos dicimus, which we call Genesis. But another fascinating thing about this particular manuscript is you have an editor who didn't like that printing. A later editor, not Gutenberg, not his team, has put a strike through quae nos dicimus and wrote id est on the top for that is. This scribe preferred the book breath begins that is Genesis is what he decided to write. Now, coming down to this next line, we can read this together. A principio, in the beginning, this is a C-R, another E, creavit deus. This D, this is called a ligature, how the D and the E connect and actually seem to bond together. Deus, kelu. Now, this is an interesting notation. Do you see this bar over the U? That's telling me that there's another letter coming after it. But for the sake of space, you all know how much room an M takes up. This should be chylum. The bar at the top tells me there's an M coming next. And that saves the scribe or the printer some space. Now, here's another interesting facet. This is medieval Latin. This is 1400s Latin. So what we would say in classical Latin, chylum for sky or heaven, they've reduced to celum, a C-E-L-U-M. So um, in the beginning, God created the heaven et terram and the earth. Terra altem erat in anis et vacua. And again, we have a mark here telling us there should be an M. Oh, excuse me, no, no, no. That, that, et, that is warning us of the et. Mea culpa. So the earth, however, was um, formless and void. At tenebrae, now here we have erat, but this line above it tells me there should be an N there. At tenebrae erant, and shadows were sup. Now this P has a line through it, which means it's actually super. And shadows were over fakie. There's a line, so what should it be? Fakiem. And there were shadows over the face, abyssy of the abyss. We'll stop there for just a moment because I want to share something else with you as we come through. Oh, wait, no, I want to go to one more line, one more line, and then we'll stop. Now we have this phrase et s p s. Yes, that's one of those tall s's. And then you have the secondary s et s p s. And it's got a line over it. Now this line meant there was an m missing. The line in erat meant it really should be errant. The line for kalum really means it should be kalum. So we know this should mean something, but perhaps we're not quite sure what. 
So here is another website, Megan. This is the Capelli Online website. And this is a lifesaver tool to help you with these abbreviations. I can put in the character what I'm seeing. What I'm seeing is an SPS. And then I'm going to hit enter and I'm going to come down here and some dedicated digital people to whom I am very grateful created a whole database of what SPS can mean. And here's our SPS right here, but in a kinder font. SPS is, stands for Spiritus. This is something that we refer to as the Nomen Sacrum or the Nomina Sacra, the sacred names. And the sacred names, names referring to God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, are often abbreviated and shortened in this way, possibly for, well, very likely for the sake of space, they're familiar words, and sometimes perhaps out of respect. So we have here, et scriptus, excuse me, et spiritus dei, and the spirit of God, ferrebat, was carried. This is actually Ferrebat Tour, that two is a UR, was carried super aquas over the waters. Now, from just that little bit, I think you can see why I'm telling you always go look at the English first. It helps, excuse me, not the English, the Latin written out. The English too can help you, certainly, but the Latin written out in the Vulgate text. You can easily find them online, print them out, look at the Latin so the students know what they're looking for. And then it becomes a little bit of an adventure, a little bit of a decoding, interpreting exercise. Now, if I wanted to use this with upper school students, and I do, when I get to Latin Alive book three, we have the subjunctive and we have the fiats, the fiats. And this passage is an excellent one that I love to give my students for the fiats. Here we have Dixit Quay. That little three there is actually a, cute, a clue for me that it means quay. Dixit quay Deus. And God said, fiat looks, let there be light. Et facta est. This time the line is telling me there's an ST mixing. ST mixing. Et facta est looks and light was made. So fantastic example here of the present subjunctive of fiat. It's a counterpart in the passive form of facio, uh, let light be made and light was made. You have that wonderful grammar lesson reinforced here through scripture and with the beauty of this manuscript. So I think we'll move on from here and tackle another one. But you can see again, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to know your Latin and able to, in order to be able to read this, in order to be able to suss out these clues. And it definitely helps for them to see that printed copy first. So the next manuscript I want to share with you is also at the Harry Ransom Center. And this is something that you can find on your own. If you go to, and so Megan, if you would put the Harry Ransom Center link in the chat box, and I've given you just the general link to the database for the medieval and modern, uh, early modern manuscript collections. And I have looked here for, particularly for Catullus, if you browse a name, and I'll show you how to do a search in just a minute, you can find a number of different manuscripts, and you can find the complete digital facsimile available online. And I've already pulled that up for you here, but before we go, I want to show you right here, it leaves, gives you the shelf mark. The shelf mark is like the call number for a manuscript. HRC is Harry Ransom Center. This is their manuscript 32, and it's Catullus. This also gives you some really nice information about what to find in here. It tells you where it's from and the year it's from, how many leaves, that is the folio. And this one is actually a paper. This one is a paper one and it's in a humanistic script. So we'll see what that looks like. Now, for those of you who are in Latin Alive book two, this poem that I'm about to show you is the towards the end of the book. I believe it is the unit reading for unit five and it's the first time in the Latin Alive series that students see a completely unadapted, purely original text. So this manuscript is a great way to celebrate that. And this is Catullus 13, Ad Fabulam. You can see this humanistic script from a different time is a little bit easier to read, I think. Let me see if I can get this to jump up for us a little bit. And here we have this, uh, I like to show this one too, because we can see if you look faintly, the rulings. 
You can see the rulings horizontally, but also vertically. And look here how on the left-hand side, you have your initial illuminated letter. It's a darker color. It's got some beautiful decoration around it. But then you have the first letter of each line is way over here in the left-hand margin. And if you look behind it, you can see the, uh, the root, not the rubric, the rulings that mark out that margin for you. It's as if the scribes are lining up these letters here to help them continue out this line. Now, this is an actual manuscript, so it was written by hand, not printed as the Gutenberg Press was. This is actually going to be a C that's connected, and we have the phrase cannabis. Cannabis. You will dine, and this B and this N, this N notice has a line over it, so something is missing. Now, your students who read Catullus 13, whether in Latin Alive Book 2 or another source, can see this first in their printed textbook. And I encourage that, have them read it, have them translate it, discuss it, and then come here and ask them, okay, if this N has a line over it, what's missing? What does the scribe indicating we need? And this is Bene, you will dine well, my fabulous, this is his friend's name, me fabula, there's a nice evocative. You will dine well, my fabulous, apud me, at my house. And then he goes on to say, palkis, this palkis, that C and that I are blurring together just a little bit. It's like a ligature there. Palkis, and then go to here to the end of the line, diebus. In a few days, C, that's a capital, well, not, excuse me, not a capital, but it's a tall S, tall S. C, if, Dei, here you have is the gods, if the gods favent, favor Tibi, favor you. And then down here, we have also et tecum, you see a line over the U, should be an um, tecum atularis, and if you will have brought bona, that line tells you an M is missing, bonam at que, there again is that little three that I told you means que, bona, bona good, at que, and magna, a line tells you there's an M missing, magnam, and then we have down here on the next line, C, Kena, and then you this nice little squiggly line tells you there's an M missing, Kenam. So we have et tecum atularis, bonam atque magnam Kenam. And if you will have brought with you a good and great dinner. This is a great poem to read with students as you're beginning poetry, because here Catullus is making a joke. You will have, you will dine really well with me, my friend. If the gods favor you, and if you bring a good and great dinner, that's how we'll dine well. So Catullus may not be the greatest host, but this is a, a wonderful place to read. Now I want to share one other one with you and I'm gonna show you first how to search for it in the HRC database. And they have a really nice collection. I can search here for names of different authors that I want to look at. Now, not all of these are Latin. This is their whole database, but you can see, look, there's Chaucer, they have a Cicero. They have some papal writings. Let me go down a bit further. There's Oliver Cromwell. We have some kings. But I want to go to a gorgeous manuscript by the Roman poet Horace. So if I could browse, here comes the page. It shows a thumbnail sketch of one of the pages. And here we see the shelf mark. Harry Ransom Center, HRC 35, Horace what's contained for Horace. And this tells us they believe it's from Venice, Italy in the 15th century. This one is on parchment, you can see. So that means likely sheep or animal. And it says a humanistic book hand. So we'll see what that looks like. That's this one. Now, I want to go to the beginning. Hold on just one moment. Bear with me. Aha. This is the colophon I mentioned earlier. The colophon, as I said, was the publisher's mark. It's what the publisher, the book printer, would have put at the beginning, oftentimes to note where the book came from or to tell us something about the book. And if you look carefully, you can see the word incipit right here. And it tells us here we have Horace's name and then liber carminum, prim, carminum liber primus. So the first book of his songs, 
in Kip It Begins, and we can go from there. The next page, though, is absolutely exquisite. Let's see. Here we go. This is just absolutely breathtaking, especially to behold it in person. This gorgeous illumination, the blue here is lapis. And if you can see my lovely little face, I'm going to show you lapis is something that a lot of us ladies wear as jewelry. In fact, here's um, a pair of earrings I wore just for you today. And this beautiful necklace, a gift from my beloved husband at Christmas because of his wife's enthusiasm for lapis and manuscripts, but you have this beautiful lapis from these stones that are actually crushed into powder and used to create ink. And then you have the gold, right? Right here is actual gold. So just absolutely beautiful. And the intricate, just, I mean, look at the intricacy of the, the artistic work. Such, goodness, such attention, such detail, uh, just such beauty in these. And here you have a little bit of a preface and then it goes right into this initial right here is the illuminated initial for the very first poem in Horace's work. Now what I would like to do is go back to the page that you saw a sneak peek of. It's on page it's on 14 here. And I'm saying page because it's the, the scrolls here on the left. It's not the folio reference. Okay. This one right here is probably Horace's best known, best known poem. Can anybody tell what it is? I'm looking in the chat to see. It starts out with this incipit that tells me ad Leoconoe. So it's to this um, young woman named Leoconoe, and it's telling her, it's his, his cherished, his sweet Leoconoe, it's telling her to ae omitendam mathematicam. It's telling her to omit mathematics. At least that's what it sounds like. But that's not exactly what he's telling her. We'll see how mathematics plays into this poem in just a moment. But to give you a clue, if we go all the way down to the end of this poem, you can see this phrase here, carpe diem, and there's that bar over the E. This is where the famous phrase carpe diem comes from. Now, this poem is in the Latin Alive Literature book, which is the green and blue book, and it's in the reading, the section on horse. We have four of his short poems there. So you can use that book to read it in English first, I mean, excuse me, to read it in Latin first in a nice friendly text. And then you can come here. Something I particularly love about this manuscript is all of the notes. So you have the rubric in red. And then if you notice, you have this circle with a line through it and some dots. And that pairs well with this over here. And if I slide my screen over, and if we move in a little bit, you can see for those of you who might be familiar with Latin poetry, you can see here the word meter. And it's giving the meter of the poem and helping orient the reader with what kind of meter Horace is writing in. So very helpful. And then if I go and look at, let me see. <clears throat> excuse me, over here on the left, look at these font and the script in between the lines. The script in between the lines are notes that perhaps the owner of this text has written in here to reinterpret, restate what he's writing. So for those of you teachers who teach literature and the students are able to have their own book, and you tell them to make notes in their books to help them with their reading. And this is a great example of what you're asking them to do and how this is a tradition, writing in your book, making helpful, productive notes in your book to help further your reading. This is a tradition that goes back to the medievals. I will leave this as a nugget for you to come back to at a, at a later time instead of reading through this one entirely together. But I wanted to share this with you and share this resource with you. 
Okay, the last one that I would like to go to is this website, St. Patrick's Confessio. And so Megan, if you would again update our uh, chat box with a wonderful um, link here. Okay. Oh, thank you, Megan, for putting the, the Latin Alive book in there too. That's helpful. But if you'll go ahead and add the St. Patrick in there as well. I love this website, first of all, because, well, it's just gorgeous manuscripts. But I like that you have here multiple manuscripts of one particular work all in one convenient location. And if I go to this link, the Confessio di Epistola, they have here conveniently for you, again, the Latin text in a nice, easy to read form. The Principio, excuse me, the uh, Confessio of St. Patrick is also in the Latin Alive literature book, Literature from Cicero to Newton. And when Galen DuBose and I put that together, it was intentionally done in order to provide for students and teachers and classes and everyone a really comprehensive look. Well, maybe comprehensive is not the right word because you can't be completely comprehensive. There's so much out there. But a really nice overview, a survey, if you will, of literature that goes from the time period of Cicero all the way down to Isaac Newton to show students the spans of time that Latin covers and the great variety of genres that Latin covers. So you see readings about science, physics, Newton's uh, three laws of motion from the Principia. You see a number of ecclesiastical works. You see the classics. You see some Virgil and some Cicero, some Phaedrus fables. But we also have this wonderful piece that I just love by St. Patrick, and it's his confession. And let's look at this together before we look at the manuscripts, as I would encourage you to do with your students. It begins, Ego Patricius Peccator, Rusticissimus et Minimus Omnium Fidelium. So I, Patrick, a sinner, most rustic. We, I joke with the kids, it's like so country, so country. Et Minimus Omnium Fidelium, and least of all the faithful, et Comteptibilimus, Comteptibilimus, and most contemptible apud plurimos among many. Patrem habui calpurnium. I had a father, Calpurnius, diaconum filium quindam, a certain son of a deacon, potitiae presbyterii. Um, I'm sorry, I had a father, Calpurnius, a deacon, the son, a certain son, potitiae presbyterii, of Potitius the elder, qui fuit vico, who lived in a village, and this is the name of the village, is Bavanam Tabernia, Vilulam enem propoe, prope habuit. Um, he had a little villa nearby, ubi ego capturam dedi, where I was captured. Anorum eram tunc fere sedecum. I was then about 16 of years or 16 years old. And this is wonderful to read with students for them to realize that when Patrick was taken captive, he was in essence their age. He was a teenager. And what begins as a story of the captivity and the hardship and the suffering of Patrick, a youth who is struggling with his faith, who really isn't, uh, does not have a strong faith at that age at 16. It moves from this story of suffering into a testimony of worship and thanksgiving as an older man looking back on God's grace and God's mercy, even through discipline. And Patrick describes it as the love of a father for a son. Such was God's love for him, even through moments of discipline. It's beautiful, beautiful passage. But here we want to go and look at the manuscript together. So having looked at this page, and perhaps practicing it in class and reading it together in class, we can now go to the manuscripts page. And here we have a great number of them. Now, and, and I believe these are all listed in order. So for example, this one is uh, from Dublin. It's in Dublin. It's the Book of Armagh, Trinity College, and it tells you the manuscript, and it's ninth century, so that's 800s. This one is in the National Library of Paris, 10th century. And this is actually the one that I start with. We'll look at this one in just a moment, but it's in an insular script that can be difficult to read. This one is Carolinian minuscule 
and it's going to be friendlier to our eyes. So if I open this one, not as fancy as the Horus, which was just dripping with illumination and very fancy. This was, Horus would have certainly been something created, commissioned really, by a, a gentleman, a family of, of some wealth. But here, I love this first initial with the nice Celtic knot on it. And let's see, I know I can enlarge this. Oh, here we go, here are my enlarging keys. Oops, a little bit too much. Here we go. So here again, we can read the ego and then patricius peccator. Here we have again these S's and now this S and T are an alligature. They have bonded together. So you have the S and then you have a T whose crossbar is intersecting the S, which makes it look like an F, but it's not an F, it's an S. Rustic isimus, and there you can see the S is without their ligature T, et. Now this is an abbreviation that has come down into our day. The ampersand, what we call an ampersand, is really a ligature of an E and a T that have bonded together and therefore stands for et. But we have used that medieval ligature from scripts produced by scribes of the ages to even use as an abbreviation for us in our day. So et minimus om, this M has a line over it. So it's, that's alluding to the N that should be here. Omnia, when it drops off, we have another line telling us there should be an M here. So that's I, U, and there should be an M. Fidelium, here we have another ampersand, another et ligature, et contempt, Ibilissimus apud plurimus. So, and most contemptible among many. Patrem habui, calpornium diaconum, filium, there's the sun, right? And here's the sun's name. Here we have the presbyter. Here it's an abbreviation. So, see how helpful it was to know that word ahead of time to have seen it ahead of time, but you can also use the Capelli tool that I gave you to insert those words and look them up. So the presbyter, right? And here we have where he lived, the village, the villula. And then here we have prope. You see how this P has this squiggle that comes through and curves around? That's telling me it should be a pro. So prope, he lived nearby. Ubi ego capturum, excuse me, capturum. Dedi, where I was taken captive, honorum eram tunc ferre, right? Um, that's that almost, thence nearly. And here we have some lovely Roman numerals here instead of the word, because Roman numerals save us space. And the testimony goes from there. Now, for fun, I will share with you one more, and I want to go back and look at the Book of Armagh, because this is such an incredible piece of history here, being from the 800s, which you're going to see in a moment. Look, oh, this is a bit challenging, a bit challenging to read. So this is a text called Insular, and it's insular, you may recognize that from the word insula, island. An insular text is really unique to Ireland, Scotland, Northern England, those what we sometimes refer to as the British Isles area. And this is where this comes from. The Book of Kells that we saw at the very first page would also be an insular script. So if I pull this down a little bit, you might be able to make out I, N, this is an N, C, I, P, and then you have an I with some script afterwards. So this is your incipit, right? And then we have talking about the, the, the incipit beginning St. Patrick. Here you have the E. This is connected to a G. This is actually a G right here. If you go to insular script, um, we can go look at that in a moment. If you would like, the insular script right here is a G. So ego, and then we have patricius. This is actually an S down here. Peccator, and it goes on from there. Um, 
again, this is challenging. And so you want to start with a nice modern font, a nice modern printed book in your class. Go to a manuscript that's a little friendlier to your eyes. I would always encourage you as a teacher to use the sources like Capelli and like the manuscript index to prepare yourself for the manuscript the students are about to read, to even share that with them, and then walk them through these things, maybe even in groups. Um, that's the way that, that we would sometimes do this at my studies at University of Edinburgh. We would look at a manuscript together and we would talk through it. Uh, sometime, usually at, at our stage, this is graduate school, we didn't know the work. So we got to figure out the work as we went along, made it an extra fun challenge. But for your students, we want to be kind, we want to be gentle. So show them the, the nice, pretty modern text first. Now I have one more thing I want to share with you all. Let's see. And that is something else that I like to do towards the end of the year after I have been looking at manuscripts. And I typically do this not with my younger classes, but with my reading classes. And that is a paleography project. Uh, this actually, idea actually originally came to me because with my own children here at Grace Academy where they grew up, in fourth grade, they used to have an illuminated manuscript project where their art teacher, Miss Robin McLaurin, in all of her creativity, would have them take a Bible verse they would work on and they would have to write it out and illuminate it and decorate it. And a friend of mine, the same Nick Martin I told you about who introduced me to the Harry Ransom Center, also shared this project with me. And he, it reminded me so much of what my own children did in fourth grade. I thought, oh, this is absolutely wonderful. For my students at Grace Academy, it's a throwback to the grammar school years, uh, but it's also a way to embrace the study of, of reading. And I like to do it after my poetry in, in particular, because you have short poems like the one I shared with you from Horace and the one from Catullus that can be easily accomplished, easily done. But certainly if, if you want to use scripture, you could use just a couple of verses and make it a nice project for you there as well. But if I tap on this, I won't go through the whole thing, but I have here provided for you instructions on how you could create your own paleography project. And I've also included a lovely copy of Carpe Diem by one of my former students who is now a lovely alumna off doing great things at universities. And I'm sure she's still treasuring her Latin, but I required them to go ahead and put their own heading, make their own little colophon of sorts. They had to create their own first in initial letter. So this is the T from the Tune. And then notice how she had her lines put in. She has her first letter. And she even went through and did some of the nice abbreviations, the nice symbols that were used in a manuscript. And then down here below at the end, the bottom, I love this illumination. This, this poem talks about the Tyrrhenian Sea and the washing of the waves and the storms. And so she has worked that into her poem. It also talks about how you should strain your wine. It, it carpe diem doesn't mean to go out and live it up. It means to realize that each day could be your last. So do it with honor. Drink your wine in a restrained way. Liquefy your wine. Cut back long hope into a short space. Don't trust in tomorrow. Make the best of today. And so with that theme of, of straining your wine, she has her grapes over here too, pouring out and washing into the sea below. Really, really lovely job by, by my, one of my beloved students. So this is something you might want to work into your class too, after having read your Latin, then enjoyed your manuscripts, you can dive into a lovely project like this and have students create their own work. The last thing that I would say is that I would encourage you to also go ahead and look into um, where you live and what manuscripts might be available to you. As I mentioned here at the Harry Ransom Center at UT Austin, I'm actually able to take my high school students once a year to go to the reading room and to look at manuscripts. I know Texas A&M where my sons both attended also has a wonderful manuscript collection. They don't have a Gutenberg Bible though, only UT does. They uh, have a wonderful collection though, and you can go look there if you, if you would like. So I would suggest to you teachers, wherever you are, to go do a little bit of research, contact the universities and the libraries in your area. When I was in Edinburgh, Scotland, the National Library of Edinburgh had one of the Gutenberg Bibles. So I was able to go see a copy there as well. 
and talk to them. I guarantee you those manuscript stewards, their, their curators, are eager to share their passion and their treasures with you and with your students because they want these to be valued and treasured by the generations to come. So I would encourage you to look and see what local resources you might have. Certainly these digital copies make it so easy to bring into class, to hold up on a screen, even to print out some, but there's nothing that really replaces the experience of actually going and standing in front of an illuminated copy of Horace or a first folio of Shakespeare, even in English, or Dante's Divine Comedy in Italian, and to stand and look and see and behold the love, the attention, the care, and I think especially in terms of biblical texts, the sense of worship that comes in the, the work that these monks have brought to the attention of this manuscript, how they've preserved it for us through time and with such care and with such beauty. So that concludes my show and tell, and I'm happy to go ahead and entertain questions. Thank you so much, Karen, awesome. So let's see, if you wanna put your questions in the Q&A chat, we can start with what we have already, but feel free to queue yours up here. So we have one from Marie Nelson, um, who says, I am homeschooling an eight-year-old who loves Latin. Can you recommend nice. a Latin manuscript for her level? Um, so just in general, any ways to include lower um, grammar school students? And lower grammar school students is the challenge here because when you find a manuscript, it's going to be an original piece of Latin, not an adaptation. So two things that I would suggest are one, scripture. If you are a Christian, if you're a person of faith and you have scripture that you're reading at home or in school, I would say show them that because even if they can't read the full sentence, they can pick out some words. They could recognize in Genesis 1 the word terra, earth, and the word kylom, sky, and the word et. So you can help them fill in the blanks of the words they don't know and encourage them to read what they do know and then use a script like that Gutenberg Bible to show them that. Another great passage that I, I wanted to include, but for the sake of time, I didn't, you know, John 1, in principio erat verbum. That's another one. I actually know in principio erat verbum is one of, I believe, the chapter mottos in Latin for children, primer A. So you can find some of those things right there, right? And they can recognize that. And such excitement for them, even if they can't read an entire page, if they can recognize a sentence, a phrase, like in principio erat verbum, and realize, wow, this was written back in the 1400s with Gutenberg's printing press, or looking at a book, the Book of Kells, find that phrase there and realize how old that book is and that they're reading that. I think that's something, it just, it just transports you. So that's another one. Also, even St. Patrick's Confession, I, I mentioned that earlier, our fourth grade class here at Grace Academy, they study St. Patrick. They, I, I believe they still memorize St. Patrick's breastplate, and so even doing a little bit of that first sentence, if the if you as a parent or have the Latin teacher come in and just work through a few words and show them the manuscript and help them identify even just those first few words in each manuscript, I think that's a way to start fostering that love for, for literature, for ancient, for medieval literature. Oh, good, Shannon. I'm glad you're going to UT. It's fantastic. Aaron Pratt is the curator there, and he is amazing. Tell him Karen Moore sent you. Perfect. Awesome. Any other questions queuing up? Otherwise, I know there's a few who pitched in from the office. You had some. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I think somebody has a raised hand. Um, let's see. I don't know if I'm able to do Oh, Nathan has his question in the chat here. There we go. Um, are you aware of any manuscripts kept in Japan? Very interesting, Nathan. I have not researched that far, though I will tell you. Hmm. So two ways that I try to find manuscripts. In fact, I had a colleague tell me that he knew of a manuscript. He knew of a text. Let's say text. He'd seen a text about St. Columba of Scotland commanding the Loch Ness monster to go away and leave people alone. I'm paraphrasing. And he said, can you find this manuscript? And sometimes even doing a Google search 
will, if you, you have to put an MS. So if you noticed, oh, I don't think I had those slides, but a lot of times I'm gonna type this in here. You'll want to say MS and then for example, HRC 35, right? That's the shelf mark, MS stands for manuscript. So if you type in something like MS and then St. Columba Life, something like that, um, you can a lot of times find, it, it will, Google will give you some manuscripts where you can start looking. That's one way to start looking. As for where they are in Japan, Nathan, I would find out what national libraries you have there. And I would go to the libraries. A lot of times the library will have a link to manuscripts or contact somebody at the library and ask them, I'm looking for Latin manuscripts that might be housed either at your national library or elsewhere in Japan, can you help me? And again, these are people who are passionate about their study, they have a great love for them. And so I would say that would be the best place to start. Awesome. And anyone who lives in the Northeast, I know there's at least two Gutenberg Bibles in New York City. I think there's one in um, Lynchburg, Virginia. Just trying to think of- Yes, one. there's quite a few here in the States. Mm -hmm. You'll always be surprised what you find. <laughs> oh, and by the way, there is another Gutenberg Bible digitized online through the British Library. So if you, again, Google that Gutenberg Bible, digital copy, British Library, that will come up. I use the one here at the Harry Ransom Center because it's easier to zoom in on the pages. I was having trouble getting a clear zoom shot, but it's actually interesting. If you go look at the Gutenberg Bible for the British Library on their website, Remember how I showed you that the editor of this book had put a strike through that quae nos dicimus phrase and then wrote id est over it. Well, if you go to the British library one, the id est isn't there and the strike through isn't there. So again, that's a way you can see a lot of times errors and corrections really tell you a story about that manuscript. And so you know, okay, this was definitely a later editor who did this. Awesome. Oh, thank you, Megan. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> You're on top of everything. There it is. There's the link. <laughs> any other questions for now? We can also, if there's any that you think of later, feel free to write into us and we can send them off to Karen. We've got one in the Q&A. Um, can you put who we should contact at the Ransom Center? Let's see. Answer live. That's from Brittany Eaton. Okay. Hold on one second. <laughs> Aaron Pratt is the head curator. So I'll put his name here. Perfect. Like Chris Pratt of, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy, but not related. And I think it'll have- then, But he's not the person you contact. He's a good person to talk to once you're there, but I'm going to find, hold on, I'm, I'm going to find her name. Just one moment, I'm, I'm cheating. I'm looking at my phone. Okay, here we go. So- I think it has your messages going to only hosts and panelists. So if you switch it to everyone- oh. See, there you go. Thank you, everyone. There we go. So Kay Millen at Austin Texas. Okay, so Catherine is phenomenal and she is basically the, the keeper of the gate, the keeper of the door at the Harry Ransom Center Medieval Collection. And so if you want to set up a time to come in and do a reading, then she can help you. But I will let you know this, that there's that you can't just walk in and plop down and read a manuscript. You first need to go in, you do an orientation, they give you a training session. And even then you have to request manuscripts in advance. These are not on the, the stacks of a shelf, like at your local library, where you just can just go pick one up. These are treasures. They are put in carefully wrapped boxes. Um, oh, I should have thought to bring pictures. But when you go read one, they actually put them on velvet cushions, right? Because they're, they're old and they're delicate. So they put them on velvet cushions. So you have to plan in advance to go read. And before you can request a book, you have to become a member at the Harry Ransom Center and you have to go through the orientation. But it's, it's not a terribly difficult process and it's well, well worth it. In most libraries, are the orientations free or are they, does it depend on if it's a public? No, I don't believe it cost me anything at the HRC. At, at the National Library of Scotland, I became a member there while I was studying and there was a small nominal fee, I, I think, but it was, it was very like five pounds. I mean, it was, it was very, very light. 
Amazing. It's awesome to know we have these, you know, for free available to us. If yes. It's awesome. Yes. I see Miss Eaton said they have pictures of that. Are you talking about the Gutenberg Bible? The, they know, I believe that they do. They're very proud of their Gutenberg Bible. Also, for those of you, oh, 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 yes. For those of you who are in Austin, the area right now, go to, and you can get there through the web link that Megan shared earlier, but the Gutenberg Bible is about to launch a new exhibit on old books. And they have a first folio of Shakespeare. Those are rare. Those are very rare. And Harry Ransom Center is very protective of theirs, but they're going to have it in a glass case that you can go look at it, as well as a collection of a lot of other books. I know they have a Newton's Principia as well. I'm not sure if that will be on display, but they have an amazing collection and it's free to go in the museum. They have a donation box when you walk in, but you can, you can just go in and look at the Gutenberg Bible and walk, and then go past in the exhibit hall and see lots of wonderful old books. So go, go, go. If you're not in Austin, then plan a trip to Austin. Although you might want to wait one more month because right now it's the inferno. Awesome. And then we can probably take one more last question and then I'll go ahead and just share with you a little bit more with Cap and then we'll wrap up here. But I'll give you a quick second if anyone wants to squeeze in a last one. I'll go ahead and share my screen real quick. I've got just a couple of things for you. Let's see, share screen. There we go. All right, so uh, first here, we have some more information on Karen's book series, Latin Alive. Um, so this is for upper school Latin students. Um, and it includes grammatical training and engaging readings. Um, and includes a lot of historical context, which is exciting. And there will be a revised edition coming out in the next year or two, I believe. So um, lots to look forward to with her series. And um, yeah, so keep that in mind. And then also at CAP, we have Classical U courses. So Classical U is a platform where um, there are courses on professional development and um, classically specific um, training. So I believe Karen has one on teaching Latin as like for teachers. So if you are interested in building your skills with Latin teaching, feel free to check that out at classicalu.com. Megan, then, if I could jump in real quick before you go on to school A. At Classical U, the course that Megan mentioned, I have one that's called Latin for Teachers, and it's going through the first beginning years, really more for grammar school, elementary school age. But I just finished filming a series with Classical U that will be for upper level teachers that has a little bit of the manuscripts and it has a, a lot of wonderful art and archaeology that pairs well with readings in the Latin Alive series. So that watch for that coming out sometime next year. Yes, awesome. Thank you for that reminder. Yes, I'm excited for that one too. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for that. We've got lots more content from Karen on there, especially with Latin. And then last but not least, we have Scully Academy. So Scully Academy has courses for homeschoolers who are interested in um, working with tutors for specific subjects. So for example, if you yourself don't know Latin as well, but you'd like to teach your child Latin, feel free to check out scolaacademy.com and you can get in touch with some tutors from lower school to upper school um, Latin. So um, enrollment is open for fall 2023 courses. And yeah, so that's all I've got there for you on the latest from CAP. Um, awesome. So thank you everyone for coming on out and thank you Karen so much for your presentation. I'll go ahead and get a recording out to you. It'll be emailed on Tuesday and I'll include the links Karen sent our way. So we can tuck those in our back pocket when it's time to read some manuscripts. All right. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Karen.